AT&T envisioned a phone in every home. We called it universal service. Today, our vision at AT&T has expanded and gone beyond even our wildest dreams. We call it the network of the future. Here to tell us about one of its components, advanced packet technology, Bob Lucky. The map behind me is symbolic of the AT&T telecommunications network. It's vast, it's incredibly busy, and it's constantly evolving. One of the great challenges we have here at Bell Labs is guiding the evolution of this network and the customer premises equipment that attaches to it. One of the cornerstones of that evolution is packet technology. The state of the art in packet technology today is for packetization of data only. Packet switches typically operate at rates of several hundred to several thousand packets per second, with delays on the order of several hundred milliseconds. At Bell Labs, we've developed advanced packet technology, which allows the packetization of speech and image, as well as data. In the past, uh, customers have used the telephone, and that meant voice communication only. What our customers really want, we think, is a multimedia uh, conversation, where you, not just, where you don't just use the voice, but you use pictures also. It's really uh, different whether somebody is typing at a terminal, we have only characters trickling uh, through the system, or whether we have a picture coming in, it's like an avalanche of information that goes across uh, the network uh, to your terminal. And uh, this very uh, big difference in the density of information that goes between the uh, conversational partners in a, a telephone multimedia conversation uh, is very well uh, used by packet technology. Bell Labs has also demonstrated packet switches that operate at throughput, exceeding several million packets per second, at very minimal delays on the order of 10 to 20 milliseconds. So far, you've heard a lot about packet technology. It's time to see the real thing. When I speak into this packet phone, it takes my speech, turns it into data, and fills up packets which are sent out on the line. Or the packets could have been data from my computer terminal. The other thing the packet phone has to do is to check the addresses on all the packets flowing by on the line to see if any are for me. The address corresponds, it pulls those packets off the line and turns it back into speech or back into data from my computer terminal. That's a big job for a little box like this. And frankly, I was amazed that our researchers were able to put all of that technology into the single board you see in the base of this packet phone. One of the advantages of the packet phone is that we've integrated the data and voice functions and integrated them into a local area network. Often, in the office environment, you're interested in having a voice conference and a data conference simultaneously. You may have a number of people talking about a document. You'd like them all to see the document and maybe even make editorial changes in the document while everybody else is seeing what's happening. But you have this shared visual space and in this visual space, you are creating something that everybody agrees with and everybody can buy into. One of the things that distinguishes the packet phone from other data and voice systems is that we have found a way to give voice samples priority over the data samples so that if anything gets delayed, it's the data and not the voice. The packet phone we've been discussing is intended for a local application, like within a building. There, your phone can examine the address on all the packets going by and determine which are for you. That's a simple job. But what about out there in the network, where you've got all those packets from everywhere that need to be rooted? We're pursuing research that addresses this question. It's called wideband packet technology. We'll be discussing two of its elements, the access interface and the wideband packet switch. The access interface is a very important component of the wideband packet technology network. What it does is it allows the customer to gain access to this packet network of the future. The access interface is, if you will, the gateway to the uh, packet network. It is the conversion point where circuit switch services, voice signaling data, are all converted to a packet form. An important feature of the access interface is embedded coding. This technique encodes voice at 32 kilobits per second, using four bits per voice sample. The voice packet has two bits in each sample that carry essential information, and two other bits that carry supplemental information. Under heavily loaded conditions, the supplemental bits can be dropped so that only essential parts are transmitted. Think of all these packets 
carrying different kinds of information for different users, all getting thrown together and transmitted into the network and coming out again. How do we keep order? Someone came up with the idea of a binary sort. Very simple, especially when done with modern microelectronics. Developed at Bell Labs, this idea has allowed us to build a switch that handles all the traffic out in the network. The wideband packet switch uses a distributed architecture. And the heart of this architecture is the switch node, interconnected in a matrix of nodes to form a distributed switching fabric. The fabric is self-routing and has the intelligence to direct a packet to its destination. For example, a packet with an 001 address enters at input A and is switched node by node through the fabric until it arrives at the correct output B. A unique aspect of this design is that packets with the same destination can enter the fabric at any input and be routed to the correct output. So if a packet enters at C addressed 001, it will also go to B. This distributed architecture provides high capacity performance required for future networks. A little while ago, I referred to the evolution of the telecommunications network. We've seen that packets are a very important factor in this evolution. They represent a fundamentally new way of looking at communications, both for customer premises networks and for the AT&T telecommunications network. One hundred years ago, when Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone, he could never have dreamed that someday we would be speaking to machines. Our research at Bell Laboratories has revolutionized the field of communications. With the advent of computers, we entered a new age of information exchange. With the advent of talking computers, this information is becoming easily accessible to all of us. The computer is no longer an imposing technology remote from human beings. Instead, it is becoming an integral part of our lives, and one in which there are limitless possibilities for interaction in all of our everyday activities. Since the advent of computers, we have dreamed of talking machines that can easily share their information with us. That's state-of-the-art speech synthesis, and it certainly doesn't sound very natural. <laughs> well, that's for sure. Of course, the problem is that with a long sentence like this, the synthesizer really doesn't have access to the syntactic information and the information about the meaning of the sentence that it would need to produce a good version of the sentence. Mm -hmm. So maybe we ought to take a look at the syntax tree for this sentence. A syntax tree is much like the sentence diagrams we did as school children. In this more detailed version, we see the subject and object of the main sentence, as well as the relative and introductory clauses. From the syntax tree, we create a prosody tree, which is different because the major nodes tell us how strongly various words should cohere together, and how large the boundary should be between various words. So the result of playing this should be a sentence intonation that's a little closer to the way a person would say it. Sure, well, well let's try this. When we do our analysis, the result is that we want to have two breaks in the sentence. One here, between the initial introductory clause and the core sentence, and a second stronger one over here, between the core sentence and the relative clause that follows it. Since the advent of computers, we have dreamed of talking machines that can easily share their information with us. Well, that really was better, and I think it was better because this sentence really is awfully complex. Mm -hmm. And that gave us a nice pattern of pauses and pitch variations in the sentence. And it's exactly that pitch variation and the phrasing that goes with it that allows a listener to understand what the structure of the sentence is meant to be, and so to comprehend the meaning of the sentence better. Although what we're concentrating on is basic research into the underlying linguistic issues here, this is probably a system that will be useful for helping computers to communicate better with people. A second area of pioneering research is speech recognition. Their initial goals were very simple to train a machine to recognize single words and phrases spoken by a particular individual. We've been working in the field of speech recognition for more than a decade, improving both algorithms and hardware. First, we recognize isolated words from known speakers. 
Then we extended this capability to unknown speakers, or what is known as speaker independent recognition. The ultimate goal, a most difficult one, will be the recognition of fluent speech. There are a lot of problems we've had to face in, in our research and speech recognition. One of the very first problems is the variability of speakers saying words over and over again. They make small changes and in some cases big changes. A word like either might be spoken either one time and either a different time. A word like eight, which is a very simple word, you can say eight without a release, so you can say eight and heavily release the word. So we had to figure out how to handle variability problems. A second problem that was a major one that we thought was making the system so it was truly speaker independent. We had to develop a wide variety of procedures for looking at multiple patterns by different people and deciding how many patterns we really needed to, re to actually represent the, di the different words. Today, our capability in recognition technology is limited. We can handle digit strings and sequences of words. In the following airline reservations demonstration, Larry Rabiner illustrates this capability. I want to make a reservation, please. Please intensify your travel plans. I want to go to Los Angeles on Monday morning. Flight number one leaves New York at 10 a.m. arrives in Los Angeles at 12.50 p.m. How much is the fare? The round trip coach fare is $388. When will we have the capability that we see in movies like uh, Star Wars or like the original Space Odyssey? Probably that will be decades away, where we actually have fluent speech recognition by a machine. Ambitious goals often call for unusual measures. Speech recognition is so difficult that we humans integrate visual clues, like lip motion, as an aid in recognition. Why not give computers the same capability? That's just what we're trying to do. Humans are remarkably skilled at recognizing speech in a variety of acoustic environments. Computers, on the other hand, do not have the repertoire of context, semantic information, or a world knowledge that is necessary in understanding language. Eric Pettigen has set himself the task of building a machine with a visual ability. Here at Murray Hill, we're engaged in very basic research. This is the present head-mounted camera apparatus. A relatively cumbersome device. Uh, in the near future, we'll be mounting a very small camera on this uh, microphone boom right about here. The miniature camera is used to capture video frames of the face. Each frame is analyzed, and lip parameters are extracted from it and used to form a visual speech template. By combining this information with the output of the acoustic speech recognizer, the overall performance of the speech recognizer is improved. The ultimate goal is to give the computer all of the sense modalities and all the facilities that the human being has, therefore maximizing the communication between the human and the computer. Speech recognition is a hard problem, yet an even harder one lies ahead, and that is language understanding, the association of meaning with the words recognized. The main goal of my research is to let people be able to talk to computers in their own language, for example, English, without having to go through a lot of training, and yet still be able to trust the system in terms of the correctness of the output that they produce. One of the main problems we find is the larger the vocabulary and the larger the number of English structures a system can process, the harder it becomes for the system to find a unique interpretation of a sentence. That is to say, the sentence becomes ambiguous, and a user wants to be very sure that what the system understands his sentence to mean coincides with what he intended. The system I'm working on answers typed English questions. As one example of an application of this technology, maybe I'm interested in vacationing in the Northeast. I call a travel agent and ask where the tallest mountains are, and that person might log into a computer that has information about the White Mountain National Forest, as another example input, I might want to know how high the mountains are on the Franconia Ridge. So I'll ask that question. How high are the mountains on the Franconia Ridge? Notice that since I had asked how high the mountains are, the answer included a table that was sorted in terms of highest to lowest.
The processing techniques are in fact independent of whether the input is typed or spoken. So at some later date, when we link voice technology together with a system such as this, one will be able more or less to discard the keyboard, ask a question in a microphone, have the question processed, and in fact in many cases have a voice output as well perhaps as graphics on the screen. As we have seen from this program, we are on the threshold of a new era of communications, computers that can talk, listen, and understand. But what does this mean to all of us? This capability will ensure the transfer of valuable information to an ever-widening audience. To be sure, we have just begun this very difficult task that we at Bell Labs believe it to be important for all of us.